Today, we're going to build a working executable using the theory we covered last month. Our goal for today is that the reverse engineering tool PEBear can correctly pass the generated executable file. We've got a lot to do, so let's dive right into the first couple of components, the DOS header and stub. Both of these nodes are fairly simple. As outlined last time, the DOS header only has two fields that are of any relevance to us. The DOS signature at the beginning and the file offset to our actual file header at the end. Since the signature is a constant value, we only need a number input for that offset, as it's dependent on the size of the DOS stub, which we may want to edit. Similarly, most bytes contained in the DOS stub are static for our purposes. The only part we might want to change is the actual error message displayed by the program. We may want to shorten it in the future to optimize our file size a little bit. So we'll add a text input, which will allow us to change this DOS compatibility message. Let's jump into the DOS stub node and check out the internal node graph. The network starts with a port and type node defining our message input. Strings on DOS machines are terminated with a dollar symbol, so we add that with a simple join node. We then prepend the fixed byte sequence defining the DOS instructions for printing that message to the screen. Some analysis of traditionally compiled executables shows that the DOS stub is aligned to 16 bytes, so we take the length of our byte string and calculate the missing amount of zeros we need to append to our output. All that's left to do now is join our DOS instruction bytes with the padding bytes and output it with an appropriate type. Moving on to the node graph of the DOS header, we first define the number input for the header offset, which we then convert to its little endian binary representation. Since this offset value is the last field in the DOS header, those bytes are simply appended to the remaining static byte sequence, and the resulting header is provided to an output port. The next component for our executable is the file header. Relevant inputs are the machine type, the section count, the size of the optional header, and the file characteristics. We'll create a separate node for selecting the machine type to simplify this node graph a bit. All it does is map selectable options to byte strings, which is an approach we've covered in earlier devlogs already. The file header node itself simply has a named input to receive this data. The section count is just a simple number input we convert to its little endian binary representation. I created a custom node for this purpose, which takes in a number string, a byte count, and a byte order, and then outputs the corresponding byte sequence. For the sake of staying on topic, I won't go over the underlying node graph in more detail. I'll cover custom utility nodes like this separately another time. The file header then contains a timestamp for the creation date, which we can generate using the built-in time node. The stamp output provides us with the current timestamp in milliseconds, but the file format requires the time in seconds. So we divide that number by 1000 and then convert it to the corresponding little endian byte sequence. Next up is the size of the optional header, which we will compute externally and convert to bytes before appending it to our output. The last fields of the file header are some characteristics stored in some bit flags, the specification of which we will again move to a separate node for the sake of modularity. Portable executables contain multiple sets of characteristics. There are the general file characteristics in the file header, the DLL characteristics in the optional header, and the characteristics in each section header, specifying their specific functionalities. In terms of node graph implementation, these are all identical. Relevant characteristic properties are each mapped to a switch input, the value of which is then converted to the binary representation through a format node. These zeros and ones are then simply joined together in the correct order, resulting in a two-byte output. This is the same for every characteristics node, so covering one is equivalent to covering them all. Probably the most time-consuming component of my executable implementation was the optional header. Like the previous nodes, it essentially boils down to concatenating a bunch of byte sequences, some of which are provided via node input, others being constant. Note that I've set the major and minor linker version to the maximum value instead of zero here, as I've been told it unofficially stands for compilation without a linker. We then require the sizes of code, 
data and uninitialized data sections, which are provided externally. The received numbers are again transformed into their little endian binary representations before being appended to the byte sequence. Next up is the entry point to our code and the file offset to our code section, also called the base of code. I decided to define the entry point as a relative offset to this base of code, since it has to be equal or higher by definition. This is achieved by a simple compile time addition of the two inputs before converting them to their little endian representations respectively. After some fixed bytes, the section and file alignment are required. These are once again defined externally, since they are needed for calculations for the upcoming section headers. So the optional header simply receives this external value and adds it to the byte sequence. Similarly, the size of the image in total and the size of the headers have to be calculated outside of this node graph, so they're just provided as another set of inputs here. I've added a number input with possible values between 0 and 16 for specifying the subsystem we require for our executable. For now, we'll only need subsystem 3, which corresponds to the console. Another socket is then provided for the previously discussed DLL characteristics we've already constructed. Finally, we need to define our heap and stack requirements. I've set these to fixed values for now, since we aren't going to use those data structures for a bit, but we'll revisit this part once our memory requirements increase. The final component of any executable are the sections and their corresponding section headers. At the end of the day, any section is just a bunch of bytes with padding to fit the file alignment specified in the optional header, regardless if it contains code or data. Unlike all the other components we tackled up until this point, the contents of a section don't follow any specification from the file format's point of view. Based on a section's characteristics, a computer is told how to interpret the bytes of a given section. If it's executable code, for example, then an instruction pointer needs to track the current instruction. If it's data of any kind on the other hand, the contents need to be made available for access from the code through memory addresses. This leads to a pretty straightforward node design where only two inputs are required. The same file alignment value we previously passed to the optional header and the byte sequence to be contained in the section. The only real complexity to this network is the determination of the necessary padding to be appended at the end of the section. To achieve this, we first fetch the length of our content byte sequence. We then round that number up to the closest multiple of our file alignment. If we then subtract the raw sequence length from this padded length, we get the amount of zero bytes we need to append. That number is then simply provided to the built-in repeat node, which repeats a provided sequence of characters the calculated amount of times. As I've outlined in my video covering the theory of this format, we will require the actual and the padded sizes of the final section or the corresponding section header. We have this information readily accessible within our section node graph due to the calculations we just did. So we can save on compile time computations by simply providing those values via some output sockets. The implementation of a section header node is very similar to the other header nodes we've built so far. It really is just a bunch of parameters we combine to one fixed size block of bytes. Any modern PE section header starts with a string of up to eight characters representing the section name. This is followed by the raw and padded sizes of the actual section we just discussed, together with the raw file offset and the relative address of the section once it's loaded into memory. Finally, it wouldn't be a PE header without some characteristic bytes, so those can be provided in a named input at the bottom. The main information that is conveyed through these section characteristics is what access permissions a given section has and what the content bytes represent. The actual node graph of the section header node ultimately boils down to the inputs being converted to little endian hex strings and then joined in the correct order. We finally have the ability to construct a byte sequence following the portable executable format. Let's put one together and check if PEBear recognizes it. We can start by dynamically calculating the header offset required by the DOS header by adding the length of the DOS stub to the DOS header's constant size of 64. This will automatically update the header offset if we ever change the DOS compatibility message. We actually need to define our sections before we continue with the headers since we require their sizes. For the time being, one section for our code and two additional sections for initialized and uninitialized data will suffice. They'll all be empty for this test, so all we need to provide is the file alignment we want to use. 
We can then use the raw and padded sizes of each section to calculate necessary data for each corresponding section header. Note that sections containing uninitialized data should have both their raw size and offset set to zero. We'll follow the convention regarding section names for simplicity. Each section's characteristics are also simply copied from traditional compiler output. With the sections and their headers done, we can finally set up the general headers. Let's create a new optional header node and provide our raw section sizes to the first three inputs. We don't have any code in our code section yet, so our entry point is zero for lack of a better value. The base of code, the section alignment and the file alignment are then all set to traditional defaults. We'll set the header's size to the sum of the separate header sizes, aligned to the file alignment. In our case, this is simply the file alignment itself, since we don't have too much header information yet. We can calculate the total image size by taking the virtual address of our last section, adding the raw size of it, and then rounding up to the next section alignment. The DLL characteristics are again simply copied from traditional compiler output. Now that we have everything we need for the file header, let's create a new node and provide the length of our optional header to the relevant input. We can then set the machine type to x64 and the section count to 3. As with all other instances, we'll again simply copy the file characteristics used by traditional compilers for now. All that's left to do now is combine all components into a single byte sequence and write it to a file using the built-in file node. This immediately compiles everything down and writes it to our specified file path. Let's open it up in PEBear. And there we go. No errors detected. Executing this file obviously doesn't do anything, since no code is contained. All I can see is a console window popping up for a split second, but no errors are thrown, which again hints at our success. We now have everything we need to get started with actual assembly level programming. Next month, we will be setting up our first system calls and building a proper Hello World program. Exciting times await.